Yeah, typical day obviously started at home with me getting up and I used to get up at about uh, half past five, leave the house by shortly after six because by doing that I could beat all the traffic up, uh, all the commuting traffic. Could in those days anyway. I don't, yeah. I don't think leaving at six would do the business now, but it did, it did back then. And I would get to Heathrow at about 7.15, go and have coffee and something to eat. And we'd then assemble in crew reporting at about quarter to nine for the 10.30 flight. Get our briefing, half past eight, quarter to nine, something like that. Um, have a very thorough briefing, decide on the fuel we're taking, um, look at the weather obviously, any airspace restrictions, all that sort of stuff would be covered then. And you'd then go out to the airplane and typically you'd arrive at the airplane probably about an hour and a half. So you'd get to the airplane at about nine o'clock in the morning. I'd go out into the flight deck. Poor old flight engineer would go around and kick the tires and make sure there was nothing falling off anywhere. And we would then, we the pilots would go through a whole series of checks of our own for the instruments on each side of the flight deck. The flight engineer, when he came onto the flight deck, would do a similar thing with his panel and then we'd end up in a coordinated sort of series of checklists that led up eventually uh, to the engine start procedure. As far as the passenger boarding was concerned, that would start about half an hour before the chocks away time. So the passengers would typically be boarding from about 10 o'clock, five to 10, 10 o'clock onwards. And then at about 10, 15, the dispatcher would come up and say, they're all on board and everything's stowed. And we'd say, sign the load sheet say goodbye to the dispatcher and then get clearance to start our inboard engines because there's no auxiliary power unit on Concorde so you it wasn't until you started an engine that you got any hydraulic or electric power so we had to have that before we push back start the inboards and then we push back on time hopefully at 10:30 with the two inboard engines running and then as we were pushing back we'd start the outboards park the aeroplane say goodbye to the tug and the ground engineers and they would chug away in the tug and then you get your taxi clearance and out you'd go to the runway and as you were going out to the runway again you'd be doing a whole series of checks um, literally checking every single system that it was operating and you'd get to the holding point for the runway, having completed all the checks, wait your turn in the queue, line up on the runway. Uh, lining up was interesting. The flight deck was about 35 feet ahead of the nose wheel. So when you, and you wanted to use all the runway, you didn't want to waste runway yeah. in Concorde. You never want to waste runway in any aeroplane as a matter of, principle yeah. and you come onto the runway at a right angle and you taxi at a right angle until you on the flight deck were sitting overhead the far edge of the runway oh, yeah. if that makes sense yeah. and then you crank in on the nose wheel steering and swing around and you'd be lined up absolutely plumb on the yeah. center line ah. with minimum wastage of runway yeah. behind you and you'd then hold the position there until you got your, until you, you, you were always cleared to line up to start with and then you get your takeoff clearance and as soon as you got your takeoff clearance, you'd open the throttles up fully. The reheats would cut in automatically as the engine spooled up. And um, the takeoff, as I've already mentioned, I think it was extremely dynamic, very different from a normal jumbo takeoff it was all happening accelerating fast things happening very quickly and you had the same sort of key speeds as you do on any conventional um, aircraft v1 which is the decision speed below which you can abandon the takeoff yeah. and stop within the remaining length of runway 
beyond which if you have a problem you've got to take the problem into the air with you and sort it out when you're in the air yeah. then you've got rotate VR which is when you pull back on the control column and present that delta wing at an angle to the airflow to generate the lift to get you airborne yeah. and then V2 which is the safety speed and typical sort of speeds um, well 155 is a sort of fairly typical V1 198 a fairly typical sort of rotate speed 220 a fairly typical um, V2 yeah. um, once you were airborne uh, you'd have a subsonic climb up to 28,000 feet a short subsonic cruise going over the west country out to the Bristol Channel yeah. then you get your transonic acceleration clearance open the throttles reheats on again climb and accelerate reheats on until a mark number of 1.7 and then you cut the reheats and coast it up rather more gently from 43,000 feet which is roughly where you reach 1.7 Mach number and you reach Mach 2 at 50,000 feet and you then just leave the throttles wide open and the airplane would cruise climb as you got lighter of course as you burnt the fuel off you'd sort of climb up and eventually you'd reach probably about 58 59,000 feet yeah. on the other side of the Atlantic and you'd then do a deceleration and descent process to bring you back to subsonic flight making sure that you were subsonic at least 55 miles from the coastline so that you didn't land sonic booms on Manhattan mm -hmm. and then once you were subsonic you'd just become part of the subsonic traffic flow just like any other aeroplane and then when it came into the landing a very easy aeroplane to land uh, we'd, we, we used to do what we call reduced noise approaches <coughs> it had a wonderful auto throttle system which was very precise if you wanted 153 knots that's exactly what you got 153 yeah. knots no messing about and what we used to do is we'd come down at 190 knots down to 800 feet so that we were a traveling faster b cutting down the noise b cutting down the fuel used and then at 800 feet we'd plumb in the threshold speed which typically was around 160 knots and then over the next 300 feet as you were descending down the glide slope you'd be shedding 30 knots of airspeed as you went from 190 knots down to 160 knots and then the last 500 feet you'd be coming down on a stable approach and then as you got near the runway that great delta wing was compressing the air between the underside of the wing and the runway surface and it would almost land itself and you'd have main wheel touch down and then lower the nose wheel control column hard forward you've disconnected the auto throttles at this stage by the way control column hard forward and then you come in with the reverse thrust and the wonderful carbon fiber brakes which worked brilliantly well and you could stop the aeroplane very very quickly if you really needed to yeah. and then you taxi to the gate and the passengers would disembark and more often than not they disembark say oh I wish the flight could have been a bit longer we were enjoying it so much and that really genuinely was the reaction of the great majority of the passengers really? yeah but did a lot of people fly just for the experience no the regulars on the regular flights um, I mean we carried a lot of people from uh, the, the investment banks Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, yeah. Cantor Fitzgerald, poor old Cantor Fitzgerald of course with the lot that virtually had all their staff killed in the dreadful 9-11 yeah. thing. They were our regulars but and probably the, the uh, if you're sort of trying to sort of single out the biggest group I would say they were probably the biggest group. Right. Yeah. But then we'd carry politicians. I mean, I've carried Henry Kissinger dozens and dozens of times. Um, you carry the great classical musicians. Um, Pavarotti is somebody I've carried many, many times. Um, and then you'd have all the film stars. Paul Newman comes to mind. Um, 
and and the, and of course the the, the pop mus musicians as well. Yeah. So it, it was a sort of galaxy. It was it was always fascinating to look at a passenger list on Concorde because there were invariably a whole lot of household names that sprung out of the <laughs> out of that passenger list statue. I can imagine.